Go for it. I got a mute button, man. Welcome to the Rogue Startups Podcast, where two startup founders are sharing lessons learned and pitfalls to avoid in their online businesses. And now, here's Dave and Craig. All right, welcome back to another episode of Rogue Startups. This is episode 155. Uh, Dave, how are you doing this week? I am doing great after several stressful days with business directory plugin, uh, but it's all good now. You're <laughs> how about earning you, your, my friend? Earning your gray hair over there? <laughs> well, what, what gray hair is still remaining clinging to my head, yes. The rest <laughs> of it is being ripped out actively or falling out on its own. Oh, it's fantastic, man. Yeah, we've had, uh, you know, it's funny, we've had a pretty calm last couple of days, but really the two weeks before were just like this mad, like sprint-a-thon, just crazy. Um, you know, it's funny, Jonathan, our lead developer for Castos, very smartly told me, he said, Craig, we should do a code freeze uh, like two weeks before Christmas because we don't need to go breaking stuff right before uh, the holidays. It sounds like uh, we were talking a little before we started recording. It sounds like uh, maybe you'll do that next year, right? <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, it's funny. So this wasn't really a code freeze. This is something I had actually deferred for a very long time. Oh, okay. Because I had, I had tested it once and it... Um, it didn't go real smooth. And so I was like, uh, I think I'm going to let a couple more bug patches come out before I try this for real. So here's the whole sorted story here. So of course I'm using easy digital downloads on both of the plugin sites. And I had, uh, seen releases that came out. And of course I have a general rule about easy digital downloads, upgrades. I never upgrade on a major point release until I see a few patch, uh, versions come out afterwards. Mm -hmm. Cause inevitably there's always crap that's going on. I've, I've been that guy that jumped right on it and all I did was suffer. So I just, I just don't do that. I just wait. <laughs> yeah. And then I'll test it and I'll, and I'll see how it goes. So I did it on AWPCP, did it in staging, worked okay. Did it in production, also worked okay. I was like, all right, cool. This isn't so bad. And this is after I had been probably deferring it for probably about three months, something like that. Okay. Then I went and tested it for business directory plugin, did it on staging. Didn't go so okay. <laughs> and I'm like, huh, all right, well, we'll let this one go a little bit longer. So I waited for another three dot releases on the, the software licensing module. And, uh, you know, by that time, my other one had gotten a little long in the tooth. Like, so there's, I've, I've got like, I don't know, eight or nine easy digital downloads, things installed. And, you know, a lot of them I can just update fearlessly like PDF invoices and stuff like that. CSV um, imports and duplicate downloads and things like that. But the core ones of recurring payments, software licensing, and the main plugin itself, I upgrade those much more carefully. Mm -hmm. uh, anyway, so when I went to, uh, test it again, staging work this time. And I'm like, yes, all right, we finally made it. It took forever, but it worked. And it told me that I had like 25,000 records that it was moving there. And I was like, all right, yeah, all right, that's not so bad. Then I went and did it on production. Holy shit, it all went sideways. So it also <laughs> took forever to even get to this point. But then when it got to the end, it basically said, yeah, the, uh, the, your easy digital downloads needs an upgrade. Please uh, start the upgrade process here again. And this was after a, a whole day of me waiting through and doing this three-step, click this button and wait for hours and keep the computer active and don't navigate away from the page and all this other stuff. Oh, wow. And it got to the end and it was like, yeah, you need to do it again. And I'm like, ah, 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 okay. Uh. So that's when I contacted them. And this was like Friday afternoon. Worst possible time to contact support, right? <laughs> and I'm thinking, oh, man, I am so screwed. Dave, Dave fucking Rodenbaugh. <laughs> yeah, Dave, dumbass Rodenbaugh. I mean, just add this to the long list of things that I'm a dumbass about. <laughs> but anyway, so I, I start the upgrade again. I send in the ticket to, to Pippin and company over at Easy Digital Downloads. And it, it does finally complete on Saturday morning. But that's when this, the tech support thing started rolling in. Hey, my license is expired. What the hell's going on? I just renewed this last month. 
Hey, my license is expired. I just renewed this yesterday. Hey, mm -hmm. my license is expired. You know, we got about, you know, it ended up about in the 20 range of those. Um, so I started looking around in the database after the upgrade. All of the licenses vanished. <sighs> and I'm like, ah, this could not be worse. So, you know, to Pippin and team's credit, they did actually respond to me on the weekend and they started working on it. But man, this was not an easy thing to fix. I, the only thing that saved my bacon was they have this thing where they save the legacy data. So they don't delete all the old stuff. Mm. To say, yes, it's okay to delete the old stuff. And I was like, there's no way I'm deleting that. No, <laughs> keep that shit. Digital hoarders, man. <laughs> keep that totally. shit forever. Totally. So I, I, you know, we went through the whole troubleshooting thing and I set up staging so he could take a look and see what was going on. Yeah, and after like many, many back and forths, you know, he's like, okay, yeah, this is definitely bad. Please tell me that you saved the legacy data. I said, oh, hell yeah. And he's like, okay, well, we can make something work here. So then he spent the next two and a half days creating scripts, testing it, running things, waiting for things to finish. And of course, all this time, more tech support stuff. It just keeps mm -hmm. piling in. Mm -hmm. and, you know, my poor tech support person Bobby is freaking out and she's getting really stressed and what can I tell him? I'm like, I don't have anything to tell him. Tell him we're working on it. I got nothing else. <laughs> and yesterday it finally got resolved at 4 PM. We finally got the upgrade to work. We finally got the bundles work, you know, showing the right licenses that the keys are not expired anymore. The ones that didn't um, have the ability to activate now work just fine. And so now we're back to the sort of standard things. But I mean, for a while, this affected several thousand customers. Oh. So, yeah, I mean, I, I have had all the stress of my holiday season crammed into two and a half days. Yeah. <laughs> I'm yeah. so done. I'm so done. It was, wasn't even a code deployment. This was like a, I needed to do this. I knew I needed to do this. And I thought I was okay, and I still got screwed. And mm -hmm. unfortunately, I wasn't. This is one of those things where I let it go for two days, and I still had other purchases and things like that. So I could have rolled back to Thursday, but then I would have had to add back in a bunch of purchases and lost automatic upgrades and stuff like that. And I said, Pippin, what should I do? And he's like, Yeah, all right, don't upgrade. We'll we'll dig into this, and I think we can fix it. But yeah, you know, in the end, it worked out. But that was some tense, tense weekend. Oh, man, that's tough. That's tough. And that's not even Gutenberg and WordPress 5.0, right? That's oh, God, no, no, no. Yeah. And we just <laughs> to make sure that we're fully compatible with all that. That's actually the least of my worries right now. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, so we are on a code lockdown now until after the first of the year. There's nothing else except yeah. emergency, emergency fixes only, and it's got to be something that's like breaking the crap out of people's sites, like PHP errors, white screen of death, Mm -hmm. Otherwise, we ain't putting shit out. <laughs> mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I, I want a peaceful holiday, damn it. Yeah. No, I mean, we, you know, I took Jonathan's, the kind of the spirit of what he said to heart. And we've been, we've been moving pretty deliberately for the last couple of weeks, like really long-term thinking stuff. So we'll have a bunch of things we release after the holidays, probably because we've got like three or four things that are in the works, but nothing is going out between now and then. Just, yeah. We have, you know, some bug, you know, hot fixes and things like that, that, uh, we still cowboy code a little. <laughs> uh, hey, there's nothing like a good hot fix every now and then to keep you awake. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, but uh, yeah, I mean, no, no big things. But after the first year, we were planning on some big, some pretty big changes. So uh, it'll be interesting to see how that goes. But yeah, I mean, you know, like the thing with the, the WordPress thing is like, it's just really tough to say like, I'm going to base my whole like software licensing distribution stuff on a free plugin or, you know, a free plugin with paid add-ons and all this kind of stuff that like is, I hate to say like kind of susceptible to breaking. And it's not like Pippin writes really great plugins and EDD is like a fantastic tool and stuff. I look at it like objectively, like all of the WordPress stuff is just like, I hate to say delicate because that's a, that's a bad term, but like it's just delicate because there's all these variables that nobody has control over as opposed to like, if you're able to put your stuff on a 
a dedicated platform that made like had total control of all of their environments, um, it would probably be more stable. So I don't know. I mean, it's just kind of an inherent thing with WordPress. It's like the oh, bajillion, yeah. the bajillion variables that everyone has to deal with and Pippin deals with them better than everyone else probably, but it's still really, really touchy sometimes. Yeah. Would you like my science nerd vocabulary word for the day of that? Yeah, go for it. Stochiastic. You have a stochiastic system here, ah. which means that it's highly complex and the variables are very difficult to calculate. And unpredictable. Yeah. yeah. Now, yeah. I probably like somebody's probably going to come back and correct me and say the definition of sto stochiastic is, you know, here's what the Merriam Webster <laughs> version is. But that's what I remember from my time as a physics major. We would talk about stochiastic systems, and it was always describing like um, gas systems, you know, uh, yeah. when you're dealing with Boyle's law and stuff like that. Yeah. But stochiastic just always made me kind of like cringe a little bit. I was like, oh, fuck, there's so much to figure out now because it's just chaos. I mean, yeah. that's really the best way to describe it is that there is pure and total chaos. And I know, for example, um, Pippin has shared his revenue numbers publicly. I think easy digital downloads grosses around 600 something a year, at least it did a year or two ago. And he has stated that easy digital downloads is by far, by far his highest support burden product. Like they spend the most mm -hmm. on trying to deal with shit on people's sites. Yeah. It's no different than that regard than business directory plugin. And I got total 100 mad percent respect for that because it is the biggest pain in the ass ever. Yeah. Yep. Yep. Yeah, man. Yeah. I, you know, on the, on the positive front, I think, uh, Gutenberg Gidden or whatever people are calling it is Gutenberg. Really, <laughs> uh, I mean, it was really overblown. I mean, I, you know, I saw today our site for rogue startups got updated to five Oh one. Um, automatically by SiteGround because it was like a security update. Um, and as far as I know, it's not broken. We've had we've had one support request from WordPress.org for somebody that says, you know, after the update, Gutenberg and your plugin doesn't work anymore. It's, uh, we can't reproduce it, so I don't know um, what the deal is there. But yeah, for a major point update in WordPress core, it's been pretty smooth, man. We haven't had a lot of requests either at this point. We've been 5.0 compatible for a long time, but we didn't really like bend and twist the plugin to become Gutenberg block compatible uh, yeah. at all. And the short codes still work in there. We've tested it. We made sure of that. But honestly, we just didn't have customers that were like, are you going to be compatible with Gutenberg? We're upgrading to Gutenberg. Why aren't you compatible to Gutenberg? Like they're just not saying anything about it. Yeah. Um, which I think Maybe is there's a difference between like, d are you compatible with Gutenberg? Do you have a block and is my site going to break? Those are three different things, right? Sure. Sure. But I'm, I guess what I'm trying to allude to here is that I don't feel like my customer base is rushing to get to five Oh. And if they are like, uh, you know, I don't have any sites on five Oh yet. We've tested it on five Oh and know that it's okay. Yeah. But on all my sites right now, I've already installed the classic editor. Just, just because mm, mm -hmm. <laughs> I'm, I'm not ready to deal with the, the bullshit that goes with Gutenberg right now. Um, it just doesn't seem like it's baked enough for prime time. Uh, I think that we got a year of shakeout on that thing. That's my, that's my prediction. We run one of our test sites on bleeding edge. So you can, uh, you can install this, uh, this like add on or plugin to WordPress that automatically installs the latest release. Uh, like a release candidate, and we run one of our sites on it. It's crazy the shit that breaks. <laughs> <laughs> See, this yeah. is why I don't do that. Like, yeah. I'm, no, I mean it's wanna, not like it's living the bleeding pure... edge. That's like sleeping on a bed of razor blades, man. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But we do it just to you know try to see what else is out there. So, yeah, I, that's good. I think that's good. I, yeah. I, I don't know who builds sites like that. I mean, and I've seen some pretty aggressive site agencies that are out there doing stuff and they're customizing the crap out of things, but I've never seen them work on WordPress release candidates. That's, that's a little, no, too no, it's just for seeing what we can break. Yeah. Yeah. Um, well, man, I, uh, I guess like the big update for me is, uh, I guess two updates. Uh, one is after the interview last week with Moitza, 
I have been putting a lot of the shit that she uh, was dishing out into practice with my Facebook ads for Castos, and it totally works. <laughs> uh, yeah, I mean, I tweaked a couple things like right after the call with her last week, and it turned around a lot of the things that I was doing in the in the positive way, like more conversions for less money. But the biggest one really was starting to split test the creatives. So that's kind of what she said is like the biggest thing you should do if you're not doing it is split test the ads, right? So you have like three levels, like campaigns is like the overall objective. The ad set is the audience you ever take. And the ads are the the copy and the image and the call to action and all that kind of stuff. Right. So I just have been split testing the images and like using the stock images from Facebook. And it is crazy, man. Like I have, I cut some of them short already, but I'm split testing some other ones now. And I have some that are converting like for like promoting a, a blog post at like a dollar 30 per view, which is terrible. And some at like 20 cents. <laughs> Holy crap. Yeah. And they're all the same. They're, they're all coming from the same place, which I think is, you know, makes it kind of like a, a pretty fair uh, like test. You know, it's not like I had, this one's a custom image and this one's a stock image. They're all stock images and they're all, you know, from the same place and everything. So yeah, it's pretty cool. I say anybody who's running Facebook ads and not split testing just the image at first, which is what she says, and then split test the copy after you get an image or two that works. Um, so that's my plan is I'll let these image tests run for another couple of days. Cause some of them only been running a couple of days. I'll get rid of the worst two and then start testing short and long copy on the two winners. So yeah, stay tuned, I guess, but it's really cool awesome. to see that stuff start working. Yeah. Yeah. That's amazing. That's incredible. Yeah. Yeah. Well, a little update on my side on the AdWords thing. So I went and checked out performance after, I guess it's been a couple of weeks now since I started that when the whole Shopify debacle happened so that I could start getting some exposure out there for Shopify and MailChimp. I've burned through $800 and I have zero customers to show for it. So, um, that's a problem. <laughs> not ideal. <laughs> not ideal. That's yeah. We're gonna we're gonna call that not ideal. What and, uh, what were you what, like? What was your targeting or objective or how, how did you have all, all that set up? So I mean, this was very fast and loose and last minute when I put it together, and I did some very poor split testing on the the creatives basically. And of course, I don't have images because this is AdWords. You don't get images for AdWords. Uh, so it's all about headline, CTA, and copy. And then there's some extensions that you can add onto there. And I tried experimenting with all of those to try to make the ads more robust and rich. And I tweaked the bidding so that I was on the first page to get the most traffic I possibly could. And um, what I was trying to do was just basically to get anybody who was looking for MailChimp on Shopify to take a look at us instead. Because we basically have a lot of similar features. Not everything. It's not 100% overlap, but it, it's good enough. And I wanted to see if that would resonate. Mm -hmm. And what I ended up driving traffic to, and I think this is probably where the test failed. Uh, well, I think there are two dimensions of failure around my test. One was I was driving traffic straight to the Shopify app store. So they went from my ad that was touting the benefits and why you would want to use recapture over MailChimp straight to the Shopify app store, which, you know, is like abandoned carts in your face. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And it was less about email marketing and more about abandoned carts. So I'm looking at those two now going, uh, I could see that would be a little disjointed. I yep. probably should have had a landing page. Yep. So I talked to Dave Hamrick again about that. And he was like, yeah, you know, I think a landing page might have been a good idea. So I would probably restart this test after the first of the year um, and dial all of my traffic straight at a landing page that was catered exactly to that. So mm -hmm. talk about like why you would want to do recapture over MailChimp. The second place where I think I screwed up was um, I put in some specific keywords that I originally wanted to target. And then in addition to those, I, on David's recommendation, he said, well do plus Shopify plus MailChimp as a keyword by itself. And what that does in AdWords parlance, if you're not familiar, is it basically says, look for any search where the keyword Shopify and MailChimp are present on it. 
doesn't mm. matter what it is. And that turned out to be the one I got the most impressions on. And I think that's where I just wasted money because the so keywords it wasn't that, specific enough. Uh, the intent on the keywords that came up was not correct. Uh huh. Uh huh. And I think that's where I blew it. So I basically was wasting a lot of money on poor intent keywords. So what I really need to do is delete that, look at the keywords, narrow it down to ones that have better intent, where they're like doing comparisons, they're doing uh, looking for specific things about MailChimp, uh, as opposed to like, how can I install MailChimp on Shopify? Mm -hmm. when, they're, when they're thinking that way, they've already made the decision, I'm going with MailChimp. So you trying to talk them out of it at that point, Nah, it's so effective. And that was one of the keywords I had in there. So that's where I screwed the pooch on two dimensions there that I at least am aware of at this point. That, you know, d forget the copy. I noticed that I had three variations. One was doing way better than the other two. And mm. the one that did really well, uh, I paused the other two and just let that one run for a little bit, but that didn't really change anything. But the one that did really well was the one that got shown to more of the poor keywords. So oh, I, you know, I need to go back and reevaluate this because right now, yeah, I mean the, the past three days I got distracted with the whole business directory license mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and that was priority number one. So I couldn't pay attention to AdWords anymore and I'm not, I'm not going to spend money when I'm not paying attention there because that's just dumb. Yeah. And uh, yeah, so that, that happened. Plus we're trying to do some other stuff on recapture to expand integrations now. So I've been going back and forth with, my developer Mike on that, trying to figure out what it is we're doing and when and what's the priority and what's that look like and questions about the craziness of the APIs that we're dealing with and stuff like that. So, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah, the good yeah, news I mean, is I we're at this point, man. I mean, we're recording this on the 13th, right? Like, yeah. I hate to say the year is over, but yeah, I think that like starting new marketing initiatives now, uh, I don't expect much out of them. <laughs> you know, like it's just no, it's no. just nobody's paying attention right now. I was talking to a couple of their founders and they're like, this is, this month sucks. I was like, yeah, <laughs> pretty much. This is crazy. Yeah. It's just a tough time, especially the second half of December. It's just nobody cares. Yeah. It's going to shut down. Like I, I, I'm also running stuff on Capterra and you know, I already made a three month commitment to them on that one. So I just knew I was going to eat it in December. Mm hmm. So that was fine because I'll be there like immediately when everybody starts looking again in January and I'll be there in February as well. So that's when I really intend to figure that out. But I wanted to at least see some December traffic to understand what are, is anything resonating right now? What lists am I getting traction on? Which lists are getting ignored? Cause I'm yeah. in like five different categories in there. So I needed to, I needed to understand that enough so I could decide where I was going to put my dollars in January. Mm -hmm. And I think I'm getting some pretty decent data on that now, although I probably have to tweak the landing page that they've got for me. I don't think that's quite right yet. The nice thing too is, I mean, you're getting all these impressions and oh, I guess you're, you, you're, you're not sending them to your site, so you can't retarget these people, can you? Not at the moment, no. So they've got it, sending that traffic to a landing page from Unbounce. Um, okay. And I think that, that I'm probably going to want to tweak a little bit eventually. I would probably later on, I might try to send it directly to the site on a page of my own. Yeah. This one right now, they basically were saying, Hey, we've had great experience with this. If you do three month commitment, we'll do the whole page for you. And I was oh, like, yeah. okay. Yeah. So I just went and did it. And, uh, I think the call to action that I've got on the page is the wrong one for this kind of a product. So I got to get that. You. But yeah, otherwise I think it's, uh, I think the rest of the page that they had for me was pretty solid. So nice, nice, man. Cool. So, uh, yeah, man, this week, uh, I heard on the art of product podcast. Uh, so Derek Reimer and Ben Orenstein's podcast, uh, which is fantastic. It's one of the like three or four I listen to every week. Um, <laughs> Yep. So they uh, actually had Rob Walling on last week and they mentioned like kind of in passing this video we're going to be talking about from the CEO of Superhuman, uh, Raul Vora, talking about engineering product market fit. Uh, and I know, Dave, this is like uh, something kind of near and dear to both of our hearts because I think we've probably experienced it and experienced the lack of it <laughs> at different parts in our <laughs> entrepreneurial journey. But uh, I 
Dave, I watched the entire video. I made some notes for us. And so we're going to talk through kind of like, and I know you read the transcript. So yeah, business, it's a, it's a talk from business to software and these guys really do it right. They have the whole video, they have the slides and they have a full transcript. So we'll include the link to this, uh, to this page where all this shit is in the show notes. But I thought we could kind of review what we thought were some of like the key points and takeaways from, from Rose's talk. Sounds good. Cool. Um, so superhuman is a, an email tool, uh, and their kind of claim to claim to fame or their differentiator is like speed, uh, design, I guess, and kind of keyboard shortcuts. So just getting a lot of shit done in email as opposed to using Gmail with it being slow and clunky and stuff like that. Um, and so they, they start out kind of defining product market fit and have like a, a quote from Paul Graham saying uh, product market fit is building something that people want. And that's kind of obvious, but um, what they end up doing, I think, is quantifying that in a really cool way uh, using like a five step process. And I think Dave will, will kind of walk through um the, the process that they use to, to go through kind of how to define if they have product market fit and then improve on a score that they use. Yeah. So this whole thing here, it's not that we've talked about this before. This is nothing new, but what I really liked about this particular approach that Rahul uh, discusses here is that um, sometimes on these, you know, what you're basically doing here is kind of like, it's sort of like an NPS survey, but not really. It's not, ex it's not the same kind of thing. But it's like the customer development surveys I've heard. Like we talked about the ones that the guys on Moreware use and the four questions to help you really sort of hone whether you have product market fit. But this one right here, and I've seen other ones like Sean Ellis has a, a much more detailed one. It's like 10 or 12 questions long. And it, it almost borders on the uh, obnoxious, to be honest. And I've, I've tried running these things before, and the thing that I don't like about them is that I think people look at the longer surveys, and they freak out, and they go, oh, I don't, I don't want to do this. I don't care Fuck what you do instead yeah. of this. <laughs> Fuck this. I'm done. And they just don't answer. Yeah. And that's been super frustrating to me because I don't have, like, thousands of customers to draw from. So I've got to get as many responses as possible. But at the same time, if you don't ask enough questions, you don't get enough data. The thing that I think they've really nailed with this particular survey that they've created is that they have only four questions on here, but those four questions are probably the most powerful versions of these I've ever seen. In mm -hmm. fact, it was so powerful when I read through this, my first instinct was run to Google surveys right now, Google Forms, set up the survey and send it out to every recapture customer I had. Mm -hmm. The only thing that stopped me was that this whole license shit was still going on. So <laughs> I couldn't really do it, but it's still on my list. In fact, I have it sitting right in front of me on a sticky note. Yeah. But, but all right. So with all of that hype, let's talk about what the survey questions are, because this is the stuff that I think is the gold. And then there's also some other stuff that we'll get on and how they actually took this data and acted on it. And that was also the other important part, because that's the thing I haven't really seen in other customer product market fit surveys. Those, so those are the two unique things I would, I would say that this really pinpointed here that nowhere else has really done. Yeah, yeah. So the questions are, number one, how would you feel if you could no longer use your product? That's a pretty standard one. I've seen that a hundred times. And of course you do on the scale of very disappointed, somewhat disappointed, neutral, somewhat happy, very happy or something like that. Who answers very happy that I couldn't use your product ever again? I mean, I guess some, somebody who's really mad at you. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Anyway. All right. So that's question number one. So let me, let me interrupt you. I think these guys do it slightly different where they only have three options. So like very disappointed, somewhat disappointed or not disappointed. And that comes into play later with how they segment and take action on the features and stuff. So that's, that's kind of key. I think is they only have three options for that question. Yeah. And that's what it, you should do anyway, because I think the other two just don't even make sense. Like if you yeah. have people that are out, that are outwardly hostile to your product, why the hell are they using it? Yeah. 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 So, all right. So three, three answers to this, how would you no longer feel if you could use the product? Then three open ended questions where you just get random text from the user on this. First one, what type of people do you think would benefit most 
from my product. Now, what's interesting about this question is that even though you're telling this person, tell me who you think should use this product besides you, this really ends up being the person answering what kind of person they are because mm -hmm. they are using the product. And if they have answered it in a particular way, like very disappointed, then what they're basically doing is here's all about me. And here's how you can find other people like me. Yep. Which is genius. Yep. It's absolute genius. Yep. Yeah. And this and then, especially comes into play with segmenting later. Oh yeah. 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 Fucking uh, magic. Yeah. <laughs> and then the next two questions are the simplest, nicest variations of these I've seen to date. So what is the main benefit you receive from my product? So that basically are, is telling you the key features that this person is here for. So these are the things that you should be promoting. And then lastly, how can we improve our product for you? And that's uh, also a fairly standard question. And by leaving it open-ended, you let them just blather on about whatever they think that your product is missing right now. But none of this is the secret sauce. These are just great questions that get some really key data. And I like the balance between the strength of the question and the number that you have to answer. Because like when you get above five questions on a survey, everybody's like, fuck that. <laughs> oh yeah. I had yeah. one, I had one that was at least 30 questions of their day. <sighs> and I, I like, I was in a mood. I was like, I'm going to help these people. It was like someone we know or something. It's like four pages into a type form. I was like, you're getting an incomplete response from me. <laughs> I've answered 15 of your questions and I'm done like this. Yeah, it's too much. You have to be able to do it on your phone or in just a minute while you're whatever, listening to a podcast or something like that. And it can't take a lot of thought or time. Um, so Dave, I thought kind of tactically, the one interesting thing that they talked about kind of towards the end of this talk was that they send this to people about 21 days after they start using the product. So the people have kind of well-formed opinions of what's going on with the product and how they like it and what the benefits are and what you can improve and stuff like that on like a recurring basis. So you're talking about like sending it to all your recapture customers. I would love to send it to all of our Castos customers too and sales camp for that matter. They're probably even more valuable as sales camp because we have a lower degree of product market fit there. Um, but they are sending it all the time. And then revisiting and segmenting all this stuff we'll talk about later on like a recurring quarterly basis, or something like that. But they're collecting data all the time, which I think is super valuable to like at the same point in a customer's journey, which is yes. really key. Yeah. Yes. And I think that 21 days is super key. Like anybody who's uninstalled the product, you don't care. Mm -hmm. Anybody who hasn't used it for that 21 days, it's too early. Yeah. And then longer than that, they've they've got a strong enough opinion and informed enough opinion to make some solid answers come out of this here. And yeah. if you put it on like a drip sequence or something like that, it just becomes automatic. You don't even have to think about it anymore. Yeah. So that's the other thing I was like, Oh, I need to go modify a drip sequence so that at 21 days that I send this out and say, Hey, I see you've been doing this for a while. And I would only do this with paid customers because the, uh, the ones that are doing it for free, we'll get to that in a minute, but they're not, they're not the high value here. Mm hmm. Mm -hmm. I'll, I'll give a like where we're going to put this with Castos is we have a 14 day trial after those people convert, they go into a new customer campaign and I'll probably send it to them around 30 days actually. So I'll send it to them about two weeks after they convert their trial. Cause some people just have a slow time getting started, but about a month after they start. So I'll, uh, mine will be a little later than this, but yeah, I think you definitely want it a period of time after you know, they're a customer. So for me, 21 days, it'd only be about a week after they, start being, you know, officially become a customer. Um, but yeah, definitely after they've converted. Yep. yep. Yeah. Now the secret sauce on segmented, do you want to talk about this or do you want me to launch into it? Cause the, uh, I think this is the exciting part. Yeah. So I'll start and then you can kind of fill in the gaps a little bit. Um, so I think the, the interesting thing that they do is they have this concept of a high expectation customer HXC. I think it should be HEC, but whatever, HXC. <laughs> um, and really what, what this does and what it kind of brings out is like they're the most discerning super user type customers that you have. And what this allows you to do is if you segment around uh, the results of your survey around who an HXC is, it really builds like an ideal customer persona for you. Um, and maybe most specifically, it 
allows you to look at the question, the, the response to question number two, the what type of people do you think would most benefit from my product? Because your high expectation customers will be describing themselves in the response to that question. That was like the kind of magic to me uh, of kind of what they're doing with segmentation. Yeah. Yeah. And in case it wasn't clear, when we talk about the high expectation customers, we're talking about those who answered very disappointed in how you would feel if you could no longer use your product for question yeah. number one. They yeah. have to be very disappointed. It can't be any other thing. Those are the high expectation customers. Those are the ones that are really attached to what you have. So that's why you want to take their description of who should be using their product because they're basically saying in their own words, which is also super important, what that customer persona looks like. Yeah. And you can use and that exact language in marketing material, which is, again, gold. <laughs> and we probably should have stated this at the very beginning. But so Sean Ellis has a, an actual benchmark for everyone here that the ver it, that you have product market fit if more than 40% of the responses to your survey are very disappointed to the first question, right? So you have 40% of the people being high expectation customers essentially, right? So like, uh, and that's responses, not 40% of the responses, but 40% of the, the surveys you send out come back highly disappointed. Yes. Because that yes. talks about like the non-response rate too, right? There'll be 30% of the people that don't respond. So 40% is actually like a really big number. And unfortunately, it can be something that also tells you about your product. If you can't even get 40% of the people in that list to respond, maybe you don't have product market fit. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And that's kind of a harsh truth. But yeah, I mean, uh, I, I certainly have managed to deceive myself in sending out these surveys and say, oh, well, I got 40% of the people saying this. Well, I got 40% of the responses saying that, but I didn't get 40% response rate. Yeah. So yeah. it's still hard to say, do you really have mark product market fit or not? If you can't get 40%, which I think is kind of harsh, but it is what it is. So that's, that's Sean Ellis's uh, indicators there, but you, you got to take what you got to get, you get here. I mean, whatever customer feedback you get is good. Talking to customers is always good. And even if you don't get 40%, you're at least getting something here. And that's what really counts. Yeah. Right? yeah. And I love this because it, it is like, quantifiable, actionable data. And they talk about like what they do with it then, right? So like they, they send out the survey, they have these four questions, they segment the responses and categorize people into kind of two different categories that they talk about. And then like the third step of this whole process is to analyze the data. Um, and the first step, I love it, is throw out all of the not disappointed if I could no longer use your product crowd because they're just, they don't like you. They don't, you don't have product market fit with those people. And the example that Raul used in the, the talk was specific to superhuman. It's a, you know, it's a, an email tool, like people from customer service roles that responded, right? They're not going to like a Gmail replacement. They're going to want intercom or help scout or Zendesk or something, right? So like something that's kind of like Gmail, but a lot better is just not the right tool for them. So they're going to naturally be like this. I wouldn't be disappointed if I couldn't use your product anymore. So you should totally disregard everything they have to say because they're not your target audience. Um, and that's a really nice way of like throwing out the shit that doesn't matter, I think. Yeah. And it really also helps you measure engagement. I mean, these things are interesting to read, but I think this is the key part of the survey. Just because they responded to the survey and they gave you some feedback, the fact that they said not disappointed means that their level of engagement is not something you should pay attention to. And that's something I've not seen in other surveys where they've said, yeah. ignore this feedback specifically. They just say, here's the feedback and then look at the feedback for these users. But they never say, ignore all of this. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so that's, that's one thing that Rahul says. And I think that's super important here. Yeah. Because yeah. you get a lot of shitty feedback. Oh, no, and this is a great way to just say all of this whole group's feedback isn't important for me, right? Like you're not going to have 100% product market fit with the entire addressable audience of an email tool. So don't even try. Just say, this is not for you. That's great. We're going to make it really great for these other two groups, the somewhat disappointed and very disappointed crowds, right? Yes, yes. 
And now after you've disregarded the not disappointed, so then you go to um, the very disappointed and you build a word cloud out of what they've had to say. And then you take the somewhat disappointed and you do the same thing. Yep. And then yep. starting with that, you look at the very disappointed crowd and look at their word cloud and then see if there's some recurring themes here. Are they all talking about certain things that they would all like to see? Are they all talking about similar features that they think are missing? Are they talking about certain things that they all love and couldn't live without? What does that look like? So you got to, you know, this is where you have to do some, some thinking and you decide, okay, well, they talked about this over here and it's kind of like this over here and decide if that's the same thing or not. So there's no hard evidence and these are open-ended questions. So you just have to do the best with what you've got. But here's the interesting part. So then you go and look at the somewhat disappointed. Now, you don't just take their feedback. You don't just say, oh, well, the somewhat disappointed, I should listen to them too. And whatever the very disappointed said is missing and the somewhat disappointed said is missing, I should add. No, 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 no. That's not at all. What you should do is look at the very disappointed. If they say you're missing X, you probably should add X. If the somewhat disappointed are also saying that you should add X, then you absolutely must fucking add X immediately. Mm. Because now you've got two sets of customers, one that are saying, yes, we love your product and you should add this. And these other ones that are like, well, we kind of like your product, but it's missing this thing over here. Because that's what can bump them from somewhat disappointed to very disappointed if your product no longer exists. That's the secret. Yeah. Yeah. And so he talks about, he has like a, a graph of their somewhat dis, or very disappointed percentage over time. And they went from like 22% to almost 60% in less than a year following this exact like step, I think, as they said, we'll build the stuff the very disappointed people like, but they already love our shit. We're going to convert the somewhat disappointed people over to our side by building the stuff that they really want, that, 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 that both those crowds want. Uh, I think, yeah, that's the key in terms of implementing this stuff is implementing the stuff that those two crowds really want. And those are the, the responses to what is the main benefit you receive from my product and how can we improve my product for you? That, that questions three or four from the survey. Um, I, I fucking love it, man. I would totally, we're totally going to do this uh, here very soon. And it would be very interesting to see how it shakes out. Cause I think, um, I think we both have a pretty decent degree of product market fit already, but it'd be interesting to see how implementing this and taking action on it shakes out, you know? Well, I think the hardest thing is when you have some degree of product market fit, the question is not, what do I, you know, do I need to get more product market fit? Cause the answer is always yes. But how do you get more product market fit? What are they looking for? What's yeah. missing to make you more fitty, I guess. <laughs> That's not even a word. Uh, no, totally not a word. <laughs> yeah, how do you make them fit better, more fitty? Yeah. Um, and these are not obvious things to figure out. Like you just can't look at a product and say, oh, well, this is missing. I should just add this. Because you're users might not be thinking that that is a problem at all because there's something entirely different that you've totally forgotten all about. And that's the problem that you need to be focusing on. But unless you're asking them, you don't get that information. Mm -hmm. And so having like a, you know, a moderate degree of product market fit, I think is super dangerous because that's where founders start going, Oh, I'm smart as fuck. I can just start adding more stuff now because I got lucky the first time around and they don't know that they got lucky. Yeah. So that's where you have to really start asking these questions. And I love this survey because it basically gives you a structured way to not only ask the questions, but what questions to ask, how to analyze them. And then the, the part where you basically are acting on the advice. This is the thing that I think is really great too, because it keeps you from going off into the weeds by getting all of this advice that comes back and say, oh, well, I'll just start doing everything. No, you don't do everything. You only spend... 50% of your development time on whatever the very disappointed crowd says you are missing. That's what you focus half your time on. Mm -hmm. The other half of the time you spend trying to figure out what it is you need to convert the very disappointed into, I'm sorry, the somewhat disappointed into the very disappointed. Right. And that's it. You don't do anything else. You ignore all the people that said they're not disappointed altogether. 
So yeah. if, if your survey is coming back with a bunch of that, then maybe you need to ask some different questions. If, if you get all that in your survey, you definitely are not in product market fit mode and <laughs> you've got some harder questions to ask. Mm -hmm. But when you're mm -hmm. in partial, partial mode, that's when you can say, all right, well, what is it I should be focusing on? That's what you should be focusing on right there. Yeah, yeah. You know, the thing I like about this is, you know, I've been on this like kind of internal know, challenge with myself lately about how to systematize you know, our product process, like what we should build, how we manage bugs and things like that with Castos. Cause I mean, like you know, were getting um, kind of more mature, like how, how can I make the development process, not just this chaotic, like Craig says in Slack, this is what we're going to do today <laughs> thing. But like it has a system that follows a system. It's kind of predictable. It runs on some kind of a cycle. Um, and I like this. I mean, Raul says in the, in his talk that like the, very disappointed percentage is one of the North Star kind of metrics for their organization. And they report on it weekly. Like in the last cohort, they analyzed our North Star, you know, our very disappointed percentage is whatever, hopefully more than 40%. And so kind of, you know, we're doing quote good or not. And yeah, I love it, man. Cause I mean, I think you can take a look at this stuff. You run the survey all the time and then analyze the results. I can imagine analyzing the results monthly. Hopefully, the answers don't really change that much, you know, like you should be releasing features. And so maybe the, the, the answers change based on features and bugs that you've fixed. Um, but hopefully it just kind of keeps you going in the right direction. Um, you know, I, they, they, they talked about, like he talked about their, their word cloud and it was like really obvious. It was like, uh, you know, the whole thing about superhuman is like fast and efficient email management. And that was like those words, like fast keyboard shortcuts and offline work were like massively huge in their word cloud compared to everything else. And so it's like super easy to say like, we need to build features around this and like make everything point in this direction. Um, and I just love how it gives you like really clear, predictable uh, like path for your developers uh, instead of saying like, oh, let's just build this fucking integration because I think we should build this fucking integration. Like that's, I don't know. I mean, that's kind of the direction I'm trying to get away from in our in our organization because I think as as you look to like grow a business and we talked about like feature bloat in a SaaS product and stuff like that. Like if you don't have really quantifiable data about what your customers like and don't like, like this gives you, you can end up building shit that nobody wants and that's just a giant waste of time and resources and stuff. Um, I know, Dave, do you listen to Bootstrap Web? podcast i do i do i so jordan has really i think like run the gauntlet with building like a product process and i know that ben like one of the co-founders there is like a big product guy um but i just love hearing like how their product process has evolved and this kind of makes me think about like how they have all these systems around how the the product and design specs and engineering and QA and development, all that kind of shit works now. And I really love like hearing him talk about that stuff. Cause it's like a real process now, you know? Yeah. And I think Brian does this a lot as well. And obviously this is, you know, one of Brian's fortes is specifically systematizing processes. Like that's yeah. just what Brian really is really good at. He did it with restaurant engine. He did it with audience ops and ops calendar. And now he's doing it with process kit, which specifically is a product around all of that. Mm -hmm. But having that process means things are repeatable and predictable and sustainable. And, you know, I don't claim to have that level of, predictability in our development process, but I do have a set of processes that are in place. So I don't have to sit there and micromanage. All right, I need you to work on this now and then work on this and then work, you know, there's a series of boards on Trello and things have rules to flow from one board to the other. And occasionally I'll go in and maybe reprioritize like one of the columns that says here are features that I think we should release based on customer support and based on impact that I, I think that they would have. Mm -hmm. But aside from that, they mostly just sit there and cycle through the various boards and stuff happens. And every four weeks we say, all right, it's time for a release. Yeah. And that's made things pretty damn smooth on the plugins. I can't argue with that. It's very different with recapture because it's just the two of us. 
and me trying to figure out what it is we're building and which things are most important now and bug fixes for customers and stuff like that. It's not quite to the point where we need that yet. I have that, but we haven't really been leveraging it as much. So it very much depends on where you're at with your product. But, no, totally. you know, yeah. I'm thinking that, well, one of the reasons that I think Rahul was so successful with this is that he was able to get a large quantity of feedback because he had so many users. And I think that they were a mix of free and paid, but it was just a large fire hose level of, of users that are coming through. So I could easily see adding an email into like business directory and AWPCP's uh, sequences that basically say, hey, we'd like you to take the survey here. It's just four questions and start getting that regular feedback. Yeah. 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 And that way I would have it ready so that next time we're like, okay, well, what are we building now? Here's exactly what we're building right now. This is what everybody wants. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, I think it's kind of tough, right? Because product market fit by definition kind of needs to be at the beginning of a product's journey. But I think it's harder to do this kind of systematized thing early on. You know, because you're just like scrambling to make everyone happy <laughs> unless you have like this freemium type product. I don't even know if Superhuman is paid like from the get go or whatever. But like, um, yeah, I mean, if you're having trouble, frankly, like we are with Sales Camp getting, you know, 100 new trials a month, it's tough to send this survey and get good, actionable, insightful data. You know, so I yeah. think that like you have to have some degree of like lead flow or something to make this implementable. Yeah, this is not this is not something I would say works well for early stage products. Yeah. You you've got to have enough people going through this to figure out what your roadmap looks like. So you've got to have some level of product market fit. You can't just use this as for customer development. That's a whole different ball of wax. Yeah, but if that's a great differentiation, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So yeah. that's that's fantastic. So that was a great discovery. Uh, I hadn't listened to that particular episode of uh, Art of Product, so I'm glad that you brought that up this week because this is awesome. Yeah, no, I thought it was good, and I thought it was nice to chat through it. I got some good insights, and hopefully other folks did too. We hope you got something out of it this week as well. And if you did, we would love it if you would share Rogue Startups with somebody you think would benefit from that. And if you've got a few minutes to leave us a review in iTunes as well, we'd love to hear from you. Give us a shout, podcast at roguestartups.com if you've got any questions or comments or thoughts on what this looks like. Until next week. Thanks for listening to another episode of Rogue Startups. If you haven't already, head over to iTunes and leave a rating and review for the show. For show notes from each episode and a few extra resources to help you along your journey, head over to roguestartups.com to learn more.